My biggest surprise in the Oscars this year was when the biggest winner of the night got up on stage and referred to himself as a fraud. During his acceptance speech for Best Original Screenplay, Daniel Kwan, co-creator of Everything Everywhere All at Once, told the audience at the Dolby Theater that he never thought he was good enough. He talked about having negative thoughts about himself and shared with Hollywood's elite that he felt like an imposter. Now, this really got me thinking, because I often feel like an imposter. In fact, Every time I post a new video, I feel like this is the one where everybody's gonna realize I have no talent. Deep down, I don't know why anybody would wanna tune into me just sitting at my kitchen table, pretending like I'm on The View. What's up, America? The ladies are back live with a new co-host to kick off But Daniel Kwan is nothing like me. I mean, this guy's legit. One of his first projects was a music video that's gotten over a billion views on YouTube, Hollywood A-lister Daniel Radcliffe was in his very first movie. His next movie, Everything Everywhere All at Once, gets 11 Oscar nominations and ends up winning seven of them. Daniel Kwan is clearly the real deal. Why would somebody like that ever feel like an imposter? I had to find out. So I dug around through interviews he's given, checked out some of his old work, and what I realized is that everything starts to make sense if you realize where he came from and how he got into making films. And how almost by accident, he ended up making a movie unlike anything anybody's ever seen. Everything, everywhere, all at once. Every year, film schools pump out countless aspiring filmmakers with dreams of making their mark in the film industry. Back in 2010, Daniel Scheinart and Daniel Kwan were just two of those kids. But unlike the kids that devote years in film school learning everything there is to know about filmmaking, the two Daniels had studied none of that. Daniel Kwan's focus in college was in animation, while Daniel Scheinart's specialty was improv. They were not prepared for the competitive world of filmmaking. What they did have, though, was a lot of determination and some wacky ideas. The summer after they graduated, they worked together as camp counselors for a film camp in Boston. When the campers went home at the end of each day, the two Daniels would grab a camera and let their imaginations run wild. They worked long hours and came up with their first few wacky film shorts, some of which, lucky for us, ended up on YouTube. I'm scared. And even though they weren't the best quality, they used these YouTube films to showcase their outrageous ideas. And while the film industry didn't come calling like they had hoped, the music industry did. Their wacky, high-paced style was perfect for music videos. Just two years after graduating college, they got their first big break with the music video Houdini, which led to them working on a music video that you may have seen before. Turn down for what? This was the first time the world really got to see just how crazy the Daniels were. The song itself was about, well, nothing. It doesn't really have lyrics. So this gave the Daniels a blank canvas on which they could make a video about anything that they wanted. They came up with a video that was all about a guy who couldn't stop humping everything in sight. This dude is so out of control, he blasts through every floor of an apartment building, humping everything and everyone in his way. The guy, by the way, is Daniel Kwan himself. This video is something. It was jarring, it was chaotic, it was head spinning, it was awesome. It racked up hundreds of millions of views on YouTube and bagged the Daniels a Grammy nomination. Imagine what that must have felt like. They were fresh out of college, they were paid a measly thousand bucks for this gig, and they managed to create something that got everybody's attention. I mean, with over a billion views, it's now one of the most popular videos on all of YouTube. What was even more amazing was that they were able to accomplish this despite having no professional training. They basically just had to sit in their apartment and figure everything out as they went along. Over the next few years, they were able to flesh out their unique style. Chaotic jumps between scenes, quick edits, a kind of fast-paced, dizzying style that keeps you at the edge of your seat. Anything that would make the audience's head spin, they got good at. This is where they began to embrace what made them different from everybody else. They loved it. Now, once the stream of nonstop work got started, it was actually hard to turn it off. It's why for a couple of years, the Daniels focused all of their energies on music videos and commercials. They were so excited to be able to make a living as artists, they almost forgot what they had set out to do in the first place. They wanted to make films. In order to get back to their roots, they had to turn off the faucet, as Daniel Kwan puts it, and go back to becoming starving artists again.
Around 2014, when the Daniels were visiting a family friend, they decided to head out into a lake in a small rowboat. As they puttered along, Daniel Kwan thought, hey, how hilarious would it be if we just used farts to propel this boat across the lake? This idea would inspire them to write a film about a man on a deserted island about to kill himself when he notices a farting corpse on the shore that he uses as a jet ski to get off the island. Yeah. The Daniels filled their very first film with their trademark absurdities and humor, while also telling a story about friendship and survival. In a way, this film was a way for them to combine everything they had taught themselves about filmmaking. But they knew what they were creating was absurd, and so while they were thrilled to finally get going on the script, they were embarrassed and actually hid it from a lot of people. But it meant so much to them, and they were determined to make a good movie. After a lot of hard work and a ton of rewrites, this wacky duo of animator and improv artist managed to convince two Hollywood A-listers to play the lead roles in their movie, Paul Dano and Daniel Radcliffe, aka Harry Potter. This must have been a huge moment for the Daniels. They probably felt like they were kicking down the front door of Hollywood. It couldn't get any better than this. And to think, it all started with a fart joke. <laughs> Unfortunately, when the film was finally released in 2016 at Sundance, it didn't have quite the reception they were hoping for. A lot of people, both audiences and critics, just didn't get it. In fact, some of the audience at Sundance were so taken aback that they walked out of the theater halfway. This bothered the Daniels. In interviews, they talk about feeling as though they had failed as filmmakers. They'd already been insecure about sharing a story that meant so much to them. And now the critics were accusing them of being self-indulgent. I personally enjoy these kinds of far-fetched plots and over-the-top ideas, but it may not be everybody's cup of tea. A lot of the criticisms, I think, were just people trying to make sense of something that shouldn't have been judged as a traditional film. Lucky for us, they didn't let the reception of their first film get them down. They immediately got to work on their next feature film. It was Daniel Kwan who, once again, came up with the idea for their next movie, combining the Matrix with the multiverse. Right when he got back to LA, he shared his idea with Daniel Scheinert, and they immediately got back to work. They compiled a ton of ideas into one giant script. I think their attitude was, if the critics complained we put way too many elements into our first film, then let's just take it a step further. Let's film the next one with everything. Over the course of a few years and a series of extensive rewrites, the script would eventually evolve into a mind-bendy, meta-narrative, martial arts extravaganza titled appropriately, Everything Everywhere All at Once. In a way, this film became almost like a big F you to anyone telling them what they could or could not do. When they were told they needed to constrain it to one genre, they went in the opposite direction. They incorporated comedy, drama, sci-fi, animation. When they were told an idea was silly, they made it even more absurd. It's how they ended up with the universe where people have hot dogs for fingers. Working on this film must have reminded them of their early years creating music videos when they were asking themselves, we're doing something different, but will people get it? One thing they wanted to make sure of this time was that their outrageous ideas wouldn't get in the way of telling a meaningful story. They wanted to connect with the audience in a way they had failed to with their first film. It's why they took the time to really flesh out the characters this time around. What their characters wanted in life, their hopes, their disappointments. They made the focus of the story a middle-aged laundromat owner trying to mend the dysfunctional relationship she had with her family, touching on themes such as identity, generational trauma, and empathy. Whatever they did this time worked. When that movie hit theaters, people loved it so much, they started telling their friends about it. Soon, this small budget film that barely spent anything on marketing became a commercial success. As award season came around, the film defied expectations and started picking up minor awards. It continued to gain momentum, winning more and more awards until by the time the Oscars rolled around, it had become the frontrunner with 11 Oscar nominations, more than any other film that year. That's mind-blowing. It puts the film in the same category as films such as The Godfather and Lord of the Rings, films made by teams of seasoned professionals with years of experience making Hollywood movies. It's no wonder director Daniel Kwan would feel like he didn't deserve to win. Between the fact that neither of them had professional training and the fact that this was only their second film, they must ask themselves, how did this happen? 
I think this is why Daniel Kwan must have referred to himself as an imposter. As he accepted his Oscar, he said, I never thought I was good enough. I have self-esteem problems. My imposter syndrome is at an all-time high. This really stood out to me because I've never heard an Oscar winner refer to themselves as an imposter. Nor have I ever heard them talk about their self-esteem issues on stage before. I usually hear a bunch of thank yous and the occasional, yeah, I deserve this. So I want to take a second to explain what imposter syndrome is. Imposter syndrome is when you feel like you don't deserve something that you've got. It's like you lucked out and got a good grade on a test, or you got a promotion you didn't think you earned, and now everybody's celebrating your achievement. They're telling you how much you deserve it, which only makes you feel even less deserving. It makes you feel like you've deceived people. And worse still, it makes you anxious that people are going to eventually figure out that you're a fraud. So are the Daniels a fraud? Did their movie get all this attention just by luck or internet hype? This is my take. I think Everything Everywhere All at Once got so much attention because nobody had ever seen a film like it. Because of the Daniels' unorthodox backgrounds, animation, and improv, they introduced new ideas to filmmaking that hadn't been tried before. It's almost like when The Matrix blew away audiences when they brought Kung Fu into mainstream Hollywood. With the Daniels, you can see how each of their unique experiences shape the film. The multiverse and everything everywhere all at once plays almost exactly like an improv show, with zany idea after zany idea. And I think Daniel Kwan's experience in animation really shapes how the action flows in many of the scenes. My favorite scene it was when we were first introduced to Jobu Topaki. If you've seen the movie, I'm sure you know the scene I'm talking about because it's the one with the ass. But what I think most brilliantly showcases his influence is the universe that's made up of nothing but rocks. It has some of the most touching moments in the movie, and it only uses inanimate rocks and in subtitles. That's a master animator's instinct at work. I think the Daniels have been recognized because of their lack of mainstream experience, not in spite of it. Their lack of experience forced them to improvise and create new methods of filmmaking that ultimately resulted in a film that is truly original. Daniel Kwan should not feel like an imposter. He is a trailblazer. This movie is going to influence a whole new generation of filmmakers. Everything Everywhere All at Once ended up sweeping the Oscars with seven wins, including all of the major categories they were nominated for. And now that everybody's seen everything everywhere all at once, it's funny how people now look at the Daniels first movie, Swiss Army Man, and think, oh, now I get it. Recently, I hit a thousand subscribers on this channel, which is something that I've been working towards for a while now. And it means a lot to me. It's been a long journey, and so I celebrated a little. But then the anxiety started to creep in. Now that I had reached my first little milestone, I thought, wait a minute, do I deserve this? I mean, my videos look nothing like those slick professional videos you see here on YouTube with graphics and different camera angles. I have just one. Furthermore, I used to make videos and think, meh, no one's going to see this anyway. No pressure. Only my relatives are watching. But now that more people are watching, I know it's not a lot, but I feel like I really have to deliver. I don't want to let anybody down. And at the back of my mind, there's always going to be that voice that tells me, you talk too much. That's literally what somebody left as a comment on one of my videos. So what I'm trying to do, and what I've been trying to do with this video, is to just be open about how I'm feeling. To share with you my excitement, my insecurities, and to own it when I screw up. Like when I thought that everything everywhere all at once would never win the Oscar. There's always going to be a permanent record of that on YouTube. I'm not perfect. And I appreciate that people in my life don't expect me to be perfect. When I think this way, I get really excited to work on my next video. It makes me work harder because I feel like I can be honest in it. I hope there's something that we can take away from Daniel Kwan's story. That even an Oscar winner goes through all of the same emotions that we go through. Thank you for watching my video. And no matter what you do, please don't subscribe to this channel because it's probably just going to make me feel even more like an imposter. Just kidding. Like and subscribe because I've totally run out of relatives to keep my numbers going. I never thought of myself as a screenwriter or a storyteller. I never thought I was good enough. I have self-esteem problems. I have to thank all the people. Yes. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> thank you. Oh, God, guys. My imposter syndrome is uh, at an all-time high. Um, I